if you follow him, you have to take up your cross and that you can't be ashamed of him. And so we need to make that decision as well. Um, I don't know what you all, well, I shouldn't say I don't know, I do know exactly, what would all of you think of me if I pretended that I was single even though I was married? You know, you don't have to think very highly of somebody who does that. Um, some, if somebody who takes off their ring when they're on a trip so nobody knows they're married, you don't think very highly of someone who's like that, and yet every time we as Christians hide our light under a bushel and aren't are afraid to tell people that we're Christians and we're, we don't stand up for our faith, that's really what we're doing, is we're basically pretending that we don't know anything about Jesus Christ, and, and Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid a very high price for us, and we should be willing to live for him. Um, so uh, I'm preaching a series um, from the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I am. we're in Matthew chapter 5. Um, there's something uh, that I told you when we first started the series that I hadn't um, always repeated every time, but I wanted to mention it today. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew uh, is uh, chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. And in chapter um, 5, Jesus is basically describing um, real Christianity. In chapter 6, he's describing fake Christianity. And in chapter 7, he's describing foolish Christianity. The reason that I say that is because um, in chapter 5, he's talking about what a Christian is supposed to be like. He talks about blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. We preached about that. Um, that's real Christianity he's talking about. And it's very difficult to read these beca this because when you read uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, he talks about the meek shall inherit the earth. In fact, what I'm going to preach about today, I think, is maybe one of the most difficult passages of Scripture for American Christians to accept and to put into practice in their lives because it goes against all of our beliefs and our instincts and yet is a very clear command from Jesus Christ and we must obey it. Now, we will not see the power of God in our lives until we obey this passage. We, we're, we don't get to explain it away and make it like it doesn't apply to us. We must apply it to us. Jesus said, if you obey these words of mine, um, then you'll be a wise man who built his house on the rock. Um, chapter 6 talks about fake Christianity. Why is that? I'm not saying that it's describing someone who's not actually saved, although it can, but primarily it's talking about people who do their righteousness to be seen of men. Uh, if you... You're, um, Everything that you do, you're doing for other people. And he said, that's what the scribes and Pharisees are like. That's fake Christianity. Real Christianity is you do everything you do for God, not for people. Not to get attention from people. Not to be, not to display your, um, your alms and everything in public. And so chapter 6 is really describing fake Christianity instead of real Christianity. And then chapter 7 describes foolish Christianity. And why do I say that? Because Jesus says, at the end of chapter 7, he says... Um, Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Then he says this, everyone who hears these sayings of mine, which is referring to what he said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, I'll liken him to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And so if we hear this, if we read the words of Jesus Christ and we walk away and don't put them into practice, the Bible says we are foolish, and so that's foolish Christianity is in chapter 7. So we are still in chapter 5. We're almost done, and uh, I'm going to start reading uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 38 through 42. Verses 38 through 42, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, just, just before I start reading, to mention this, um, in, this in this entire section of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus continually says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. Ye have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. And very often people get the impression from that that Jesus is basically negating the Old Testament. He's canceling out the Old Testament, saying, You heard that was in the Old, but now I'm teaching you something different. And that's not correct. And the reason I'm telling you that's not correct is because he says, in the same sermon. He says, um, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. And he said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law. And he says, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So it is true, we know from Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 21, that Gentile Christians are not required to 
keep the Old Testament law as it was given to the Jews because that was God's covenant with the Jews. That's true. But remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is actually talking to Jews. There's not a single Gentile there. He's talking to Jews. And so he's explaining to Jewish people what is God's highest law for them? What is God's actual intention for them? And so he's saying he's, he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. He didn't come to just throw it out and say that Jewish Christians didn't have to follow it anymore. Jewish Christians, if you read the book of Acts, including the Apostle Paul, they did continue to obey the Old Testament law. But they didn't quite require Gentile Christians to obey the Old Testament law because Gentile Christians were not part of God's covenant with um, Israel. And that's something I've taught on before. But... In this passage, Jesus is not saying you don't have to follow the Old Testament law anymore. He said, "He said, whoever breaks the least of these shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps them shall be the greatest." He's not. He's not. Jesus never was for throwing out the Old Testament law. But what he's actually saying when he says, "But I say unto you," he's saying God has a higher law than what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament was God's laws governing a nation, the nation of Israel. God has a higher law, and is how God wants us to live every day as Christians. It's not something you can put as a law in a country to govern what people do. It's impossible to enforce this law, but it is God's law, how He wants His people to live, and that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. Jesus says to them. In, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And what he's teaching them is how God wants us to live. We're all sinners. Even if they kept the Old Testament law as perfectly as they could, as, as they were able on the, out, in, in, on, the, uh, with the, on the outside, he said, you're still a sinner. We're all sinners. And so you have to actually have, be, have all your sins forgiven in order to go to heaven. And so he's teaching us how God wants us to live. And so the, the, the Sermon on the Mount is extremely important because we need to learn how God wants us to live every day. And by the way, as we read this passage, you're going to think, some of you are going to think, maybe all of us will think this as we read it, this seems like almost impossible to do. Or it seems very impractical to do. It seems like if we do this, like it's not going to work out. Like... It's, we're going to have problems in our life if we actually obey what Jesus tells us to do here. But I could tell you something. Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, if you hear my words and you obey them, you'll be a wise man who built your house on a rock. You see, when you obey how Jesus tells you to live, you are going to have spiritual power and you will actually overcome the world and you will actually have victory in your life. But, you're going to have to do some things that seem illogical. They don't make sense to your natural mind. But it's very powerful. And Jesus did this, and his disciples did this, and they took over the world by following this principle, these principles. And so just um, listen with an open mind, an open heart, and ask God to show you how you can apply these principles to your life. I promise you, it will change your life. In fact, there is a very good chance... If you're a person that has struggled in your life to get along with people, you've struggled in your life and you've always felt like you never got your way and, and, and other people always got ahead and got an advantage over you and other people made more money than you and, and you just feel like your whole life's been a struggle and it's been difficult, there's a good chance that you haven't been putting this into practice. And so you think that if you try harder to dominate and control other people and to push back at all those people who are trying to control you to get your way, that you'll get ahead. And Jesus is teaching us here, it's the exact opposite because it's the way of spiritual power is what Jesus is teaching us here. And so um, ver Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now that is referring to the fact that in Old Testament law, if you poked out someone's eye and they brought you to the judge, the judge would say your punishment, if you did it intentionally, your punishment is you have to have your eye poked out too. That was keeping, that was justice, okay? That the punishment was a crime. If you, um, if you were mad, you, got, you went and punched somebody in the mouth and they lost a tooth, you know, back then you couldn't go get a gold one, right? That was it. You'd be toothless the rest of your life. The judge says, justice requires that we knock out one of your teeth. And that's what they would do. Now you get to be toothless. Now you know how it feels to be toothless, just like you knocked out someone else's tooth. Okay, That was justice. Jesus said, not one jot or tittle shall pass from the law. Jesus said, you, you keep, whoever keeps the least of these commandments 
Jesus was not saying that the law of Moses, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is he's throwing it out. He's saying this. That mentality, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, that's for government. That's for the state and nation of Israel. Okay, that's one thing. But he said, when you get that mentality between you and other people, that means you're going to take justice into your own hands. You're going to take revenge. You're going to do to other people what they do to you, and then they'll never do it to you again. You're going to show them. You're going to, don't get mad, get even. Jesus said that is not the way he wants his followers to be, and that's not the way that Jesus was. And we're, we should all be thankful that God doesn't do that to us, that we don't get what we deserve. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. So look what he says in verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain or two. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. I think this passage right here, and probably the one following it, which we'll preach on next Sunday, probably one of the hardest commands in the Bible for Christians to follow, and one of the hardest for Christians to understand. And I'll pray today that the Lord will help me to explain it to you, that you'll understand it, and you will go away excited about how God wants us to live and how we can be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray you fill me with your spirit as I speak. This is a difficult passage, but Father, as a pastor, you don't call me to shy away from the difficult passages. And very often, the reason that a passage is difficult is because that is what we need to hear. That's what we're missing. And we go through our lives as Christians struggling, and we don't know what we're missing. And very often, the passages that we avoid are the ones we need to hear the most. Father, there's a principle here that is so powerful and so important, and I pray that you would open our eyes and teach us and fill me with your spirit so that I can explain this and apply this to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message is Resist Not Evil. Resist Not Evil. Look what Jesus said. He said, I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Now that goes against all of our logical thinking. If there's evil, right, think of the saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. That sounds like if we don't resist, we're doing nothing, and so we're going to let evil triumph. It sounds like Jesus is saying, just let the bad guys win. I mean, that's what it sounds like he's saying, doesn't it? And that's hard for us to comprehend. But Jesus says this, resist not evil. But then he explains what he means by resist not evil. He gives four commands in his passage to apply the principle resist not evil. Before I talk about that passage, I want to go to a parallel passage that will actually help you to understand what Jesus means when he says, resist not evil. And that is in um, Romans chapter 12. So turn to Romans chapter 12. And I'll read another passage. It's very similar. But it kind of explains a little more detail what is actually meant in this other passage. Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to read only verse 17 through 21. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. What does Jesus mean when he says, resist not evil? Romans 12, verses 17 through 21. Now listen to this. Recompense, which means to pay or to reward. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. That word honest there, Old English, actually means like honorable. Okay, so he says provide things honest. So think about your reputation. Think about how you look to other people. Okay? If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you notice how it says recompense to no man evil for evil. You see, when Jesus says, resist not evil, he's talking about how you were resisting the evil, the evil thing that the person is doing. He's saying, if someone does something bad to you, don't do something bad back to them. 
That's what Jesus is saying. Resist not evil. He's not saying that you should just let evil people take over the world. Like, for example, does the Bible say, say that the government is the minister of God that bears the sword? Yes. God actually ordained government. It says the powers that be are ordained of God. So, for example, every nation has a military and a police force, right, that enforces the law and protects its citizens. And the Bible says that when they bear the sword, they're the minister of God. They're actually serving God. So when Jesus says resist not evil, he's not saying that it's wrong for a military to punish evil. He's not saying that it's wrong for a judge and a policeman to punish evil. He's not talking about that now. He's talking about our relationships. Your relationship with fellow Christians, your relationship with family, your relationship with friends, your relationship with neighbors and co-workers. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is referring to. And he's saying, don't do back to the person what they did to you. That's how, what you can understand because it says, recompense to no man evil for evil. So whatever the person did to you, you don't do it back to them. That's what Jesus is teaching when he says, resist not evil. And then he says this, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Can you see how in this passage, if anyone smites you on one cheek, turn him the other? That's a way to be at peace. Not, that person slapped me, I'm going to slap them back. That person said this thing to me, I'm going to say this back. You understand how in any situation, why the Bible says in, in Proverbs 15:1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, right? So that's another example. If somebody says something unkind or mean to you, if you say something mean to them, are you going to be at peace with them? No. The way that you create peace is by not recompensing evil for evil. Not doing back. Or now you're just escalating. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Including if the person slaps you. You slap them back, it's on. <laughs> right? It's on as soon as you slap them back. Okay. So he's talking about, if it be possible, as much as lieth then you live peaceably with all men. See, that's why he also says, provide things honest in the sight of men. I want you to think about this. If um, I was standing out in the parking lot and somebody came up to me and punched me, okay? And I would be like, well, I've got a right to punch him back. We're not talking about protecting your family. Come after my family, it's a little different, okay? My mom used to say this. I think she still says this. I'm a pacifist, but if you come after my grandkids or my kids, I'm going to take a gun and shoot you. That's what my mom always says, okay? Um, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to protect weak people. I'm supposed to protect my family. I want my family to think that if somebody walks in um, to my house, I'm just going to let them do whatever they want to my family. No, I'm going to protect my family. It's my responsibility. It's my job. And the government does not want me to just let somebody break into my house. And, you know, and, and there are some people, you know, bless their hearts, there are some people who act like, well, we should never have self-defense. Like, you know, a Christian shouldn't, shouldn't carry a gun or shouldn't, shouldn't uh, you know, protect themselves or protect other people. You know, and I laugh at that because what is the first thing, a person who doesn't carry a gun, a person who doesn't believe in self-defense, okay? What's the first thing they do when they're in a live shooter situation? What's the first thing they do? Call call. They call the police. <laughs> when you dial 911 and there's somebody on the rampage with a gun, your finger went 911. You know what your finger just did? It just pulled the trigger of the cop who's going to come kill the guy. I mean, you literally just killed the shooter when you dialed 911. Do you realize that? <laughs> it's kind of strange. If you will, as long as my finger is not pulling the gun. No, you're calling someone who's going to come neutralize the threat. And you know what they're going to do? The police are going to come shoot the person. Now, if you want to say, I'd rather the police do it than me, fine. That's your choice. But don't pretend you're a pacifist if you call the police. If you really believe in never, ever shooting or never defending yourself, then don't ever call the police. Just let the bad guys go all over the world and kill everybody and just let them do it, okay? So you understand this passage isn't referring to that. It's talking about relationships with each other and how we, um, and that we are to be at peace with people. So back to my example, I'm out in the parking lot, someone comes and punches me. Okay, so here I am, Pastor Dell's Baptist Church, people know who I am. And somebody punches me, and then I'm like, I'll show you. You think pastors aren't tough? And I punch him back. And it's on. Back and forth, back and forth, rolling on the ground. And somebody drives by. <laughs> and they call the newspaper. Or do we have newspapers anymore? You know, they video it and put it on Facebook. Look, Pastor Hunter is having a barroom brawl. <laughs> and I could say to everybody, I was just defending myself. He punched me first. 
Some people will believe you, some people won't. You know what's going to happen? Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If I have this attitude, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You punch me, I'm punch you. You think you're tough? Well, watch how hard I can hit, or whatever. You slash my tires, I'll slash yours, whatever. If I have that attitude, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to get a bad reputation, even if the other person did it first. And the Bible says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Think about your reputation. And if you have a reputation be someone who always argues with people, always fights with people, always, even though in every situation you could tell the story how they started it, and you, it wasn't your fault, and you're just defending yourself, you know what's going to happen? If all Christians started living like that, Christianity would have a bad reputation. Nobody would want to be a Christian. And you could still say, well, they did it first. It won't matter. It won't matter. Jesus said, I don't want my followers to have a bad reputation. Like they're always fighting for their rights, always defending themselves, always punish, always trying to get back at somebody who did something to them. That's not right. You know, Apostle Paul says, he's talking about Christians suing each other. He talks about this. He says, here's two born-again Christians, and they go before a non, an unsaved judge and ask him to solve their problems. Wow. He's like, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. But he says, you know what kind of a terrible reputation Christians have? Like, we can't work out our own problems, so we got to go to a non-Christian and get the non-Christian to solve our problems. He says this, he says, set them to judge of which are least esteemed in the church. He said, get the lowliest person in church. He should be able to resolve your problem. you got a Bible. you got the Holy Spirit. You should be able to resolve your stuff. And Paul's talking about your reputation. You know, he also says, why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? He says, if you can't work out your problems between you and another Christian, you're better off letting it go and let the person win and, let, and just leave it and forgive. He says, because otherwise you can have a bad reputation. So this is what the Bible's talking about. It's saying, don't do to other people what they did to you. And he says, think about your reputation. He says, it would be possible as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. Think about it. Somebody walks up to me and punches me now it's up to me, right? As much as lieth in you. Now remember, his, he threw the first punch. That was him. As much as lieth in you. Now, if I throw the next punch, is that my choice? That's my choice. You see, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, the first punch wasn't my choice. That was his choice. The second punch back, that's mine. As much as lieth in you. It's a whole principle God wants us to understand. Now, I'm not trying to say the guy's like going to kill me and he just keeps punching, that I wouldn't pro try to defend myself, that I wouldn't call the police, run away, or even try to grab him and restrain him and get help from someone else. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that I can't defend myself. I'm saying the Bible is talking about revenge. It's saying, you do it to me, I'm going to do it to you. You do this to me, I'm going to do it to you. It's that way of acting, that way of thinking. That's how non-Christians think. And the Bible says Jesus wants his followers to be different. Dearly beloved, verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now when it says give place unto wrath, there are a lot of translations nowadays that actually word that wrong. And so for most of my life, I actually didn't understand what that meant. But I looked it up in Greek and I realized King James is right there where it says give place unto wrath. And what it's saying is this. The word means... To move out of the way and let something else go there. Someone else go there. And so when it says give place unto wrath, it's saying this. Don't avenge yourself, but let somebody else avenge you. Who's that? That's God. Because it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Listen, every time someone does something to you, um, whether they do something physically to you or verbally or whatever, if you do something back to them, do you know what you're saying? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You're saying it's my job to create vengeance, to re get revenge. But the Bible says vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. See, God is the one that brings revenge, that brings justice. And so the Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, rather give place unto wrath. And here's the thing, when you, when someone does something wrong to you and you don't do something wrong back to them, you don't do back to them what they did to you, do you know what you're doing? You're going, God, you take that spot. You take it. 
And you can pray for that person. We're going to talk about that next week. It's that when he says, pray for those who despitefully use you. If that person repents, so here's a person, and they did something to you, and you want to do something back to them, and you step aside, and you let God stand there. Because vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know what actually happens? You can pray for them. They may repent and get saved or ask forgiveness. Then there won't be any need for revenge, for vengeance. But if they don't repent and they don't listen, vengeance is mine. I will pray, say the Lord. The God, Bible says that God will actually bring justice. But see, the problem that you and I have is we don't believe that God is going to bring justice, so we got to do it ourselves. And that's where the problem lies. We take God's job into our own hands. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, say it, the Lord. And then look at verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. Now here's somebody who's your enemy. They said mean things to you. They told lies about you. Maybe they even slapped you on one cheek and you didn't do anything. Okay? And the Bible says, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Is that kind of like if he compels you to go one mile, go with him too? Because now, not only did you not take revenge on your enemy, but you fed him and you gave him something to drink. You did something for him. You did something nice to the person who did something bad to you. We're going to talk more about that next week. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. What are you doing now? You're doing something good to someone who is doing something wrong, he's going to come under, that person's going to come under conviction. They might not even act nice to you. They might even matter that you were kind to them. But that's a way to bring conviction. And you can pray for them, and God can change their heart. But if you pray for them and they refuse to change, then they will come under God's judgment. So we have to believe that promise in the Bible, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then here's the final verse that explains resist not evil verse 21 Romans 12 verse 21 be not overcome of evil don't let evil conquer you but overcome evil with good so you see when Jesus said resist not evil he's saying don't do back to the person what they did to you instead do something good to the person who did you evil that's what the Bible's teaching that's how we can have a good reputation as Christians. And that is how we can get along with people. And that is how we can win people to Christ. Is we actually can change the world by not repaying evil for evil. Instead, overcome evil with good. So now we understand what Jesus meant when he said, resist not evil. But now Jesus gives four applications, okay? He gives four practical applications. What he means by resist not evil. So let's go back to Matthew uh, five, and we'll look at these four commands. So he says, resist not evil. That's the general command. And then he gives four specific applications. So um, look at verse 39. Verse 39, he says, so he says, resist not evil. And now he explains, he gives you four very practical. It, it's you know, Jesus is very good at telling you exactly what he wants you to do. Have you ever noticed that? Jesus doesn't go, and love everyone in this warm, fuzzy, feeling sort of way. I mean, you know, Jesus is not like that. He says something very specific. Remember he told the rich young ruler, go sell everything you have. <laughs> Jesus gives very specific instructions to people. Well, look at what he says here. Resist not evil, but... Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to overcome evil with good, the first thing you have to be willing to do. Now you notice he didn't say, turn on the other cheek and tell him, hit me again. He didn't say, to ask to be hit. Okay? He just said, turn him the other also. He's not saying that you're going to be hit, right? If you turn the other cheek, somebody hits you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek, you're not saying, hit me, hit me. You're not escalating. Obviously, he wants you to live at peace. 
If you turn the other cheek, you're giving the person, listen, an opportunity to hurt you. You're not asking them to hurt you. Does that make sense? You're giving them an opportunity. And I got to tell you, this is our greatest struggle as human beings. We get hurt by someone, and then our goal is, I'm never, ever, ever going to give that person a chance to hurt me again. Isn't that what we say? That's how we respond. You see, every time someone hurts us, we might have the revenge mentality, I'm going to give them back. Or we might have the retreat mentality, I'm going to go away and hide somewhere so that person can never hurt me again. You know, um, C.S. Lewis said, the only way to never be hurt is to never love. It's true, isn't it? If you love someone, you become vulnerable to them and they can hurt you. If you don't love anyone, have you ever met somebody who they toward the end of their life or maybe even the middle of their life they, they isolate themselves they won't have any contact with anyone they won't be around people because they don't want to be hurt they've been hurt too much it's too painful so they go off by themselves and they hide and they hate the world and I've noticed a phenomenon nowadays where people can't get along with anyone and all they do is they love their pets especially in America in America there are so many people who they can't stand humans so they just get a pet there's a lot of reasons for that. It's partly because a pet can't talk, so it can't really hurt your feelings. But there's another reason I believe it's a little darker. And I love animals, don't get, me, don't get me wrong. I love animals. I'm not super into cats, but I tolerate our cats. I'm not mean to our cats, but I do let them know who the boss is. They are. Huh? They are. They are, yeah. Not in my house. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think one of the main reasons that people isolate themselves from other humans and then pour all their love into a cat or a dog or some other kind of a pet, a little constrictor, is that you have more control over an animal. And one of the things we're frustrated about is we can't control the actions of other humans. They have free will. And yet you can control an animal. So we isolate ourselves from people because we can't control people. It's a risk. Loving people. Spending, why do people not go to church anymore? There's so many Christians that stay home and they never go to church. You know why? Because they've been hurt in church. You know what? Every single one of those Christians who have been hurt in church, they've hurt people too. You know, we all hurt each other. We're all sinners. But they've been hurt in church and they're trying to avoid being hurt so they stay home and they don't go to church anymore. You know what they're doing? They're saying, I got hit on one cheek. I'm not turning the other cheek. I want you to understand what Jesus is talking about when he says turn the other cheek. He's not saying... Ask them to hit you, dare them to hit you, try to get them to hurt, hit you. He's saying, be willing to be hurt by other people. That's tough, isn't it? You know there's a prophecy about Jesus? It says he gave his cheek to the smiter. You know, Jesus could have called 12 legions of angels, but he stood there and let them hit him. See, you or me, if we were brought before Caiaphas and we were tied up, there's nothing we can do. We can't stop people from hitting us. But Jesus Christ had 12 legions of angels he could have called. And he let them hit him. He says, I gave my cheek to the smiter. Jesus allowed people to hurt him. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, he says, if somebody smites you on your right cheek, don't run away and don't hit him back. Allow him to have the opportunity to hurt you again. Be willing to be hurt by other people. Now, this is hard to understand. But Jesus Christ was praying for those people who were hurting him. Jesus Christ died for those people who were hurting him. Jesus Christ loved the people who were hurting him. But if he were to have hit them back, if he were to have called 12 legions of angels, he would not have been able to help those people. I don't need to tell you this, but somebody slaps you on one cheek, you slap them back, they're probably not going to take the gospel track you offer them. 
Somebody says something mean to you, you say something mean back, there's your chance to share the gospel or invite them to church. It's done now. It's over. And you might, it's not fair because they hit me first. It doesn't matter. That's just the only way it works. Jesus said, if you want to be like me, you've got to love people even when they hurt you. You've got to forgive. You've got to be willing to be hurt. Jesus was willing to be hurt. And that's how he became the lamb that was slain. That took the book with the seven seals. And prayed, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. Because he was willing to be hurt. To be like Jesus, you have to be willing to be hurt by other people. And that's why Jesus said, Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Resist not evil. There are four applications. First is, be willing to be hurt by other people. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Here's the second application of how to not resist evil. How to overcome evil with good. It's found in verse 40. Look what he says in verse 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't lawsuits where there's justice and you go before a judge. Jesus told a story one time, remember? And he said that there was a judge who didn't fear God or regard man. And then a widow came and said, avenge me of my adversary. And Jesus didn't say, and that widow was bad because she didn't follow what I gave commanded. Okay, so Jesus is not saying, you need to understand here, Jesus is not saying that there's no role for a judge and that there's not a time for a, a lawsuit where you're in the right and the judge decides between you and your neighbor about your boundary or whatever. He's not just saying, let somebody sue you and take away everything that you have. That's not what he's saying because Jesus also defended, talked about the widow who needed to be defended by the judge. Jesus did believe in government, in a government having justice. And of course, we could all just let all the bad people in the world take away all our property, and then the bad, the bad people would win, right? Obviously, if we just gave up everything, there would be, America would be a horrible place to live. You need to have justice. But here's what he's really talking about. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. He's saying, be willing to lose what you have. So number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. If somebody takes something that belongs to you, okay, you need to be willing to even lose more than what you have lost. Be willing to lose what you have. You know, there are a lot of countries in the world where when someone becomes a Christian, they lose their wife, they lose their children, they lose their house, they lose their car, they lose their job, they lose, they lose everything. And they're not going to get it back. They do that for the sake of the gospel, for Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying there isn't a time and a place for justice and that there shouldn't be government officials who get justice, okay? But Jesus is saying this, be willing to lose what you have. If we live our lives with the attitude everything that belongs to me I get it nobody can take anything from me I don't want to lose anything I own I, if we focus on our possessions Jesus said if anyone gave up anything for him he would get a hundredfold now in this time and in the age to come eternal life if we are not willing to lose what we have we are not going to be able to be obedient Christians because there is going to come a time when obeying God is going to cost you. Maybe you'll lose your job. Maybe you'll lose your friends. Maybe you'll lose thing, investments and things that you have. It costs you something to be a Christian. And if you're angry about that, if I'm angry and bitter that that person didn't give me this and that, that I didn't get that, and you're all focused on what you own, what belongs to you, and all of your rights you are not going to be able to be the Christian God wants you to be. Because if you're willing to lose what you have, now you can have a good reputation as a Christian. Now you'll be able to win people to Christ because you're not all focused on your own possessions. And that's what he's talking about. Um, he talks about in, um, in uh, chapter... 
Let me go back to Romans 12 here. He says, If it be possible, as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. I have a friend. And he told me a story. He's a businessman. This was years ago. He told me a story. And he had a relative that owed him $10,000. But that relative was not a Christian. And he was really upset. He wanted to figure out a way, like sue him or whatever he could do to get that $10,000 back. And he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me very clearly and said, how much is his soul worth to you? And he knew that if he took legal action against that person, that person would hate him and he would never ever have a chance to share the gospel with that person again because that person perceived that money to belong to him or that he had a right to it. And he decided, I'm not saying everybody has to always do that. I get it that there has to be uh, law and order in our country and that's the job of the government. But there are going to be times as a Christian where you should give up your right, your own rights, so that you can be a good testimony and that you should get along with other people. When Christians live for themselves and what they can do and what they can get, and they are focused on their own rights, you know what Jesus did? He lost everything, and he came to earth, and he lost everything, and he died on a cross. He didn't try to hold on to anything in this world. Remember there was a person that wanted to follow him, and they said, Jesus, I want to follow you, and he said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no holes. <laughs> you have to be willing to lose your phone, Helen. Sorry, just kidding. Um, yes, I believe in law and order. Yes, I believe there's times where you will have to go to court. But I will tell you this, as a Christian, if your life is marked... Have you ever known people who are always suing somebody? Have you ever known people like that? Yep. They're always suing somebody. And if you talk to them, they will explain to you why they have a right to that. They will, won't they? They, don't, they never say, well, I'm just greedy and I want other people's money. I mean, maybe there's a few really, really audacious lawyers who would say that to you. Well, I'm just greedy and want people's money, my money. But have you ever known people? They're just always fighting with someone. They're always in court. They've always got a lawyer. I mean, they got a lawyer and they, he's on speed dial on their phone. Oh, I've known so many people like that. It's always like, well, you know, the property line isn't quite, you know, the neighbor did this, that happened. Somebody did that. They, you know, they, they, somebody got a mark or a scratch on my car. This person, have you ever noticed people who know people like that? And listen, maybe with those people, maybe even half the time, they're right. And that person did do them wrong. I have a question. A person that's suing their neighbors, suing their relatives, suing their coworkers, suing their job, Suing their boss, suing the government, suing, suing, suing. Do you think anyone would ever be interested in hearing the gospel from a person like that? No. Even if a lot of the times they have a right to do it. Again, I'm not saying there aren't times. I mean, if somebody comes and just walked up to my house tomorrow and said, I'm just going to move in. Your family can go park in a tent, go sleep in a tent across the river. I'd be like, excuse me, that's not happening. I'm not just going to do that. I'm not going to let him move into my house. But he just gets, just walks up to me and says, give me your keys. I'm taking your car. You're just going to have to walk to work from now on, <laughs> right? I'm not going to do that. Because you do that, you just let criminals take over the country. I'm not for that. But you know what I'm talking about. The Bible says, if any man will study the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. You know what? Christians should not be like the world. We shouldn't be always trying to get for ourselves and always fighting for our rights and always focused on if we got treated fairly in every situation, if we always got exactly what was ours, the Apostle Paul says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? You want to know when you're like Jesus? When there's somebody that owes you something and you know they're probably never going to pay you back. And you can look that person in the eye, smile, say hello, have a nice day. Maybe even share the gospel with them. Maybe even do something nice for them. It's between them and the Lord. Maybe someday they'll pay you back. Maybe God will find a way to get you that money back. Maybe God will bless you unexpectedly with money another way. Maybe you get a raise at work. Maybe 
that person will have something bad happen to them and they'll lose that money they paid you. And then God, you know, God can take care of you. The Bible says that he provides for the birds and he provides, he clothes the flowers. Shall he not much rather clothe you who ye of little faith? That's our real problems. We don't believe that God will take care of us. We don't believe that God will take vengeance for us. So we have to take vengeance ourselves. We don't believe that God will provide for our needs. So we got to go sue everybody to get what we deserve. Again, I'm not saying there isn't a time for lawsuits. I'm not saying there isn't a time for justice. But I am saying, as a Christian, Jesus says, someone wants to take away your coat, let them have your cloak. Let it go. Be willing to lose what you have. Resist not evil. How do we resist not evil? Number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. If any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat. Let him have thy cloak also. You know there's a lot of situations. If we would just let it go, forgive the person, move on with our lives, we would be happier and we would be a better testimony for Christianity. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. Uh, number three is in verse 41. Verse 41 and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Be willing to do more than is expected of you. Number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. How to overcome evil with good. Number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. Number three, be willing to do more than is expected of you. So whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Now, I haven't studied this a lot, but I have heard that Roman soldiers, by law, I haven't said this myself, that they could uh, force you to carry their pack a mile. Okay, I haven't researched this, but from what I understand, that was something, that was a law at that time. Okay, so let's take that, though, whether or not that's accurate or that they did that in Jesus' time or that they did it in Israel at that time. Let's just take it that as the idea. But let's just go a little beyond it and say, if they, whoever compels you to go a mile, in other words... You don't have a choice, okay? You don't have a choice. So what would be expected of you to go a mile? That's what's expected. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you want to win people to Christ, you want to have power, the power of God in your life, don't only do what's expected of you. Jesus actually said in another passage, he says, when you have done all these things, say... We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was commanded us. You know, whether it's... Have you ever heard this? I don't believe that a Christian should ever say this. But you know, a lot of times at work, I hear this. Every place I've ever worked. That's not my job. I'm not doing that. That's not my job. Now, I will qualify it. There are times where there are people who are lazy. And if you do their job, they'll sit there and watch you and then they'll, they'll never work at all. Okay, I actually went through that when I was uh, years ago when I was working at a window factory. I uh, I got called in the office and I was told the line's moving too slow. It was the glazer. And the glazer uh, drops the glass in uh, in the sash and it's kind of the middle of the line. So you have people feeding the line and it comes to you and you drop the glass in and you keep it going through. And it cycles through. And they said the glazer is the one that determines the speed of the line. You know, because it's all just rollers and you push the, the you push the windows down the line. And so they said, you're responsible to make sure we get our goal and we're not getting our goal. And I said, well, there are people down the line that weren't working very fast and so I have to wait for them. And they're like, no, you need to just push faster and then they'll speed up. So I'm like, okay, well, what do I do if there's no room? Well, then you go down there and help them. Okay. So <laughs> I came back, and they were literally, they called me and the other glazer in, and they were like, they were chewing us out. And they were like, it's your fault that you're not getting our goal. You know, it's like usually like 300 sash in an eight-hour period is what they wanted, and maybe we're getting 200 or whatever. So I said, okay. I went back to the line. I started slamming that glass <laughs> as fast as I could. Well, sure enough, it all fills up. So I move down, and I start putting the wood bead in. And then I move down, and then the wood bead's full, and I start pushing it through the stapler, start stapling the wood bead. And the people, 
down at the end who are putting the hardware on, you know, they look up and they're mad because it's filling up. So I move down to the hardware and I start throwing the hardware on, putting it on. And they're all mad at me. And I'm like, well, this is what they t I was told to do. Then I look up the line and the same, my boss that had called me into the office, just like the day before, is standing up there where my, where my, where my job is looking at me. So I go back up and go, is there a problem? And they say, you're doing their job for them. <laughs> I goes, well, that's what you told me to do. No, don't do their job for them. It's okay. Okay, you know. In that situation, right, there's kind of a fine line, right? You can be such a hard worker that you're doing everybody else's work and they'll stand there and watch you work and then now you're going to be even more mad because now you're doing everybody's job, right? Okay, so obviously everybody's got to pull their own weight. Okay. So I understand that I don't need to go to my job every day and do everybody's job. I understand that. But there's another kind of problem that comes, isn't it? It's like that corner needs to be swept. That trash needs to be dumped. Something needs to be done. And everybody goes, well, that's not my job. That's so-and-so's job or someone else's job. He didn't do it. A Christian should not be a person who goes, it's not my job. I'm not doing it. Now, it's different. If, the per if there's a person who's under the job, maybe you need to even go tell the boss, hey, you know, that one person, they haven't been doing their job, and it's making more work for us. There's a time and a place for that. But a Christian should not have that attitude. Not my job. I'm not doing it. Jesus said, if someone compels you to go a mile, you have to go a mile. They forced you to. You don't have a choice. He said, go with him twain. You know how that relates to being living peaceably with all men if you do your job and someone else doesn't do their job or if you do only what's required of you and then you won't do more that will affect your reputation as a Christian because you have a reputation of being someone who doesn't want to do anything more than is their job and you know what else if you go out of your way to do something for someone else that you didn't have to do that is giving Christianity a good name you will have opportunities to share the gospel because you did the second mile. You went and did something extra that you didn't have to do. Was it Jesus' job to come to earth and die on the cross for our sins? Well, according to the Bible, he chose to do that voluntarily. He didn't have to. Jesus could have stayed in heaven forever. It would have been pretty peaceful up there without any <laughs> sinners, right? He could have stayed up there in heaven. He didn't have to. He says, no one takes my life away from me. I lay it down of myself. So Christians need to have that reputation that they are willing to do more than is expected of them. Number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. Number three, be willing to do more than is expected of you. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, or go two miles with the person who forces you to go one mile. And then last of all, ver uh, number four, is in verse 42. Look at verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Be willing to give and not receive. Be willing to give and not receive. That's the last principle. It says, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now, I want to say something about this. When I was a new pastor, I wanted to help everybody. Some of you remember that stage I went through. Oh, we're going to help everybody. We're going to do whoever asks. We're going to, okay. And here's what I found out. I found out there are people in this world that will spend all their money on things that they don't need to spend their money on. And then they'll come ask you for money. And you'll take that. And then they'll, 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 they'll have you pay their rent. They'll have you pay for their clothes. They'll have you pay for their, their shoes. They'll have you pay for their food. They'll have you pay for their... Uh, their heating and all of that and then they'll just take that money and then they'll just go spend it on whatever they want uh, I'm sorry they'll take their money and go spend on whatever they want while they have you pay for everything and so there is another principle in the Bible that it says if any would not work neither should he eat right? right so the Bible says you need if you're able to work you need to work okay that's the Bible says that okay and also the Bible talks about 
that you should work and then you should have enough to help someone else as well. The Bible also says it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive, okay? So we need to teach the whole Bible, not just part of it, okay? But this part, when Jesus says, give to him that asketh thee, from him that would borrow thee, turn not away. He's talking about a genuine need where you help the person, you're actually helping them. You're not hurting them. You understand sometimes you actually hurt someone by helping them. Right? You think you're helping them, but you're actually hurting them because you're encouraging them to be more irresponsible. Okay? And so that's why the Bible has a lot of instructions on um, who you help and how and why. There's a passage in 1 Timothy. I go through that passage when I decide who the, we as a church should help because it gives instructions. Here's the kind of person you should help, the kind of person that you shouldn't help. Okay? So, and I've helped lots of people over the years. Our church has helped lots of people over the years. Many of you remember many situations like that. We've taken up uh, offerings for people um, and, and for families and things. So we're not against helping people, but in this situation, when Jesus says, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away, he's talking about a genuine need. All right, that's the cons cons context, is there's a situation, there's a genuine need, and we're going to help the person. But here's the principle I want you to think about, and it is be willing to give and not receive. You want to know what bothers us as humans? It bothers us if we are always giving and never receiving. That really bothers us because it's like, I did this for that person, I did that for that person, and then that person didn't do anything back for me. Or I feel like I'm always giving. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing I'm always giving, always giving, I'm never receiving. That bothers us. I want you to think about Jesus Christ. He's in heaven, and he came down to earth. And he said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't really receive anything. He just gave. Now, he's happy to have us in heaven. You could call that a reward for what he did. But really, he didn't need it, right? There's nothing that he needs from us. He did it because he had compassion on us. The Apostle Paul said, it is more, well, actually, he was quoting Jesus Christ. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus says, if you want to overcome evil with good, number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. Number three, be willing to do more than is expected of you. And number four, be willing to give and not receive. Listen, I struggle with this because I'm naturally more of a serving and giving person. But there always comes a point, it doesn't there, for generous people, my mom's side of the family that's this way. I know I got it from my mom. There comes a point where generous people where you are doing a lot for other people and you're spending a lot of time and money and resources on somebody and there does come a point where you go, how come I'm the one doing all the giving here? How come that person's not giving to me? How come I'm just giving, 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 giving? We have to watch that. It can cause a problem. But the solution is not to be angry and bitter and stop giving, is it? Yes, we do need to be careful who we give to, right? The Bible says, if any should not, does not work, neither should he eat, okay? Um, there comes a point, I think, when your kids are grown, they need to get a job and work and provide themselves. You don't need to give them free stuff the rest of their life, right? Okay, I understand that. So we do need to be careful who we help that we're not hurting them more than helping them. That part's true, yes. But listen... Jesus says, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow thee, turn not away. We need to be careful that we don't get to a point in our lives where we stop giving. We need to be willing to give and not receive. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, there's people out there that need the gospel. And I need to be careful about my reputation as a Christian if I'm focusing on my rights, I'll say, I'm not going to let those people hurt me anymore, but I may be ruining an opportunity to give someone the gospel. If I focus on my rights, I'll say, I have my rights, and you're not going to take anything from me, right? And if I focus on my rights, I'm saying, I don't have to do anything more than this. This is all I have to do, right? And if I'm focusing on my rights, I'll say, I've been giving enough now. It's time for somebody else to give. And the problem with that way of thinking is it can hurt my testimony, my, uh, the reputation of Christianity, and it can hurt uh, my opportunity to share the gospel with someone if I'm focused on my own rights. Resist not evil. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Number one, be willing to be hurt by other people. Number two, be willing to lose what you have. Number three, be willing to do more than is expected of you. Number four, be willing to give and not receive. Now, does the Bible promise that God will reward us? Someday in heaven, we're going to get a reward for everything that we do. But we might not get it on this earth. We might have to be willing to be like Jesus Christ and give and give and give and give until he goes to heaven. He didn't really get anything, right? Now, he gets to heaven, and what happens? God highly exalted him, gave him the name which is above every name. There was a reward for what he did. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. But he had to be willing to be hurt by other people. He had to be willing to lose what he had. He had to be willing to do more than was expected of him. He had to be willing to give and not receive. You know, this whole idea, don't overcome evil, um, don't be overcome by evil, don't repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good, it seems foolish. It seems ridiculous, but it's actually the way to change the world. I want to read you a quote by Napoleon. Now, those of you who don't know or don't know much about him, Napoleon was a great French general who conquered a large, he had a huge empire, okay? At the end of his life, he was exiled to an island, and he started reading the Bible and thinking about himself and Jesus Christ actually posted on Facebook a long quote from Napoleon, the conclusions he came to. When he was exiled on an island by himself, and he had a lot of time to think, and he was no longer an emperor, he was no longer a general. He'd been banished to this island after he was defeated. He was reading the Bible, and he was reading about Jesus Christ. And there's a whole long quote that's amazing. I don't have time to read it. I'm just going to read you a short quote, what Napoleon said when he compared himself to Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus was willing to be hurt by other people. Jesus was willing to lose what he had. Jesus was willing to do more than was expected of him. Jesus was willing to give and not receive. And think of all the people who are following Jesus Christ today. And nobody cares about Napoleon. He accomplished nothing. He, he contemplated that. He thought about that. And this is something that he said. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. So the point says, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, and Napoleon, we founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. We used the power of the sword, and we forced people to do what we wanted them to do. That's the world's model. That's the devil's model. That's the idea is use the power that you have and force people. Get your way however you need to get your way. And even if you tell yourself that what you're doing is what you have a right to do, it's the same way of thinking. He says, on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Listen to what he says about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Jesus took over the world by being willing to hurt, be hurt by other people, by being willing to lose what he had, by being willing to do more than was expected of him, by being willing to give and not receive. That's how he took over the world. He says, at this hour, millions of men would die for him. And he says this, there are only two forces in the world, the spirit and the sword. In the long run, the spirit will always be more powerful than the sword. Okay, pastor, that sounds good. There's a nice flowery language. Are there any real-life examples of people who actually did this? Well, Jesus Christ. Millions and millions of people in the world follow Jesus Christ now. So Jesus did this, and now he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. He rose from the dead, and now look at all of us are here because of Jesus Christ. We aren't here because nobody forced you to come here. You're here because you want to be here. So it did work with Jesus Christ. In the real world, does this actually work? There, I don't know uh, how much you study history. Some of you are old enough to remember this, depending on where you live. But you know, there was a time in America, there were places where black people could not vote. There was a time and place in America where black people couldn't use the same restaurant, the same um, bathroom. 
as white people. There was a time in America where they did not have equal rights. And I'm not saying everything's perfect now, but most people agree that it's a lot better than it was before. All right. And there were a lot of solutions that were proposed for this problem, okay? There were people who said, there were a lot of people who said, let's, let's take up arms, let's start a revolution, let's fight those racist white people. But there was a man named Martin Luther King Jr. And you know what he said? He said, but Jesus said, if whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law, take away his coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh of thee, from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. And he said, you know what I think? And I'm not quoting him exactly. But he said, if we go and demonstrate and march peacefully, and they sick their dogs on us, and we don't do anything to them, and they spray us with water canyons, cannons and don't do anything to them, and they arrest us and put us in jail, we don't do anything to them. And they blow up our churches with bombs and we don't do anything to them. And they uh, beat us when we're marching over the Selma Bridge. We were not going to do anything. Here's what he said. They will end up looking bad and we'll look good because we're not doing anything to defend ourselves. And he said, if we do that, we'll win. Now, most of us don't realize this, but at the time, people thought he was crazy. Many of his own people thought he was crazy. They're like, that's insanity. You'll never win that way. You don't just lay down and let people walk all over you. That'll never work. He said, it will work. We're going to do it. It'll work. And you know, all through the 60s, you can read about it. You can watch his speeches. You can, you can watch video of their marches. And he kept telling all those people, just keep doing what I say. Just keep being peaceful. He wrote about it. He preached about it. And I'm not saying Martin Luther King in any, every way is an example. He, he really wasn't. There were some things that were wrong in his life. But he actually understood this principle that when you don't resist evil, when you don't do to the person what they do to you, you end up looking good. And the person who's persecuting you looks bad. And see, that's the whole thing Jesus is saying. He says, I want my people to have a good reputation. I don't want my people to live for force and for their own rights and for anger and for revenge. I want my people. And Napoleon said, Jesus founded his empire on love. And millions of people now would die for him. And it seemed crazy. It seemed stupid. And in 1968, you can go watch the speech. I've watched it. It's very powerful. In 1968... Martin Luther King was at a church in Memphis and he preached a message called, or he gave a speech called, I've seen the mountaintop. And you know what he said? He says, I know I'm not going to live very long. Be willing to be hurt by other people. Be willing to lose what you have. Be willing to do more than is expected of you. Be willing to give and not receive. He said, I know I'm not going to live very long. But he said, I don't care. I'm not worried about that now. Because he said, I have been to the mountaintop and I have seen the promised land. What was he talking about, the promised land? The promised land was that someday, black people were going to be able to do all the same things that white people would do in America. And it seemed crazy. And the next day, someone assassinated Martin Luther King. And now he looked really stupid. Well, what did he get? Hey, the day that Jesus died on the cross, he looked really stupid. What did he get? Remember they mocked him? Oh, come down from the cross. They made fun of him. And listen, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. He was willing to be hurt. He was willing to lose. He was willing to do more. He was willing to give and not receive. 1968, 2008, 40 years later, a black man was elected president of the United States. 1968, there were places where black people couldn't vote. 1968, there were places where black people couldn't eat. They couldn't use the bathroom. That's how bad it was. 
40 years later, a black man was elected president of the United States. I'm not saying I agree with everything that that president did and believed. I don't. That's not the point of the message. I'm not saying I agree with everything that Martin Luther King did and taught. That's not the point of the message. The point is, if a person who really wasn't an example of a Christian could follow this principle, and nobody could even dream that that would happen 40 years later, we have a, actually have a black president. And today, of course, we've had black people in every position of government. If that could happen when you just follow these principles in the physical realm, think of how powerful this is in your life and in my life. If we say, we are not going to repay evil for evil, but instead, we're going to overcome evil with good. Those who try to overcome evil for evil with evil will fail. Your whole life, you're going to be frustrated. Your whole life, you're going to have problems with people. You won't be the example God wants you to be, and you're going to be frustrated your whole life because you're trying to get your rights, and you're trying to get things to go your way. And Jesus says, give all that up. Lay it all down and trust in me. Those who choose to not resist evil with evil will conquer the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a difficult message to understand and to apply. But Father, I pray that we would be a church of people that isn't focused on our rights, isn't focused on everything going the way that we want, but that we would be willing to give and to be hurt and to lose what we have so that we can win people to Christ. Father, I ask that we would lay down our rights. You said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I pray that we as Christians be willing to do this. Father, the, the clouds on the horizon are getting darker. And Christians are about to go through more difficulty and persecution in our country. And I pray, Father, that we would respond the right way, the way you taught us to respond. Be willing to be hurt by other people. To be willing to lose what we have. Be willing to do more as expected of us. To be willing to give and not receive. So that instead of being angry, miserable, frustrated people fighting with other people our whole lives, instead we'd be able to win people to Christ and be an example. And that we would get to heaven and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.